Welcome, everybody. We're just uh, in the process of letting everybody in, right? So I think we'll get started. So this brings me to what is Artful Minds? Artful Minds is a uh, community whose focus is on the artist's artistic development and growth in an online peer setting. Uh, we have weekly skill development exercises, monthly challenges, and monthly critiques, and we'll start adding master classes in about a month or so. And you can find more uh, about Artful Minds at artfulminds.ca. Now I just want to uh, introduce Ali Zyre. Thank you very much for uh, being our first interview ever. And Ali is a professional uh, oil painter out of Idaho, USA, um, who has a passion for plein air painting of pastoral landscapes and a uh, penchant towards old barns. So that's my introduction of you, Ali, but uh, can you do your own introduction, please? Sure, you bet. So I, well, just like you said, I primarily paint the pastoral landscape, and I think that's kind of indicative of where I grew up. I grew up in Utah, and um, not that it was a very rural setting, but it was suburbia, and as you kind of drew, drove out of suburbia, you'd get to these wonderful areas of barns and agriculture. And then I currently live in Meridian, Idaho, which is very, very agrarian. And I'm just really thankful that I've got a passion for this subject matter and it's just right in my backyard. So I grew up actually with a father who painted and that was my first introduction to this world of art and this world of being a professional artist. So I remember when I was about eight to 10 years old and um, I was watching my dad down in his studio using a palette knife and mixing blue grays on his uh, canvas for his painting of the Tetons. And, you know, I was in my nightgown, I was little, but I was just fascinated by the fact that he could use this tool so smoothly and mix this paint. And I thought, this is what I wanted to do. So, you know, from there it becomes elementary years of, oh, you're really good at drawing. Can you draw this for me? And yeah, I'll do it. And then the high school years, it's, the the AP art classes and everyone's painting flaming eight balls and billiard balls and you're like ah, ah. and so I had like my upbringing years were me being in Jackson and seeing these great you know artworks and bronzes and real fine art and so there was a little bit of this like disconnect that's so funny high school years of like was this really art like I don't I don't know and anyway so from there it became go to college what do you want to study? What am I going to do? I'm not sure. I'll get generals. I'll do, you know, um, I'll get those generals done. I'll take art classes. And then that led to progression of getting my bachelor of fine arts, which I did. Um, and then, you know, took some time to raise a family a little bit. And through that experience of some things that were uh, tricky and difficult amongst that element um, got me right back into art and helped me realize that yeah this is what I want to do and this is what I want to be and um, again at that point it was kind of like now how how do I do this I've had this degree I've had this knowledge base but how and that then led me to just like what this platform that you created and back in so this was probably like Ooh, seven years ago, which these online media platforms really weren't about. It was definitely you go and you take a workshop from a professional artist. And so that's what I did. I went to Sun Valley and studied under Catherine Statz. And so it was through that experience that that kind of opened my eyes a little bit to this idea of being a professional artist at it, not a little longer amateur, not a hobby, but a professional and that certainly is a gap that you'll have to ask yourself and say, how do I bridge that gap and how do I do it? But it opened my eyes up to see both that I needed to gain knowledge in technicality of painting and plein air painting, both studio painting and plein air. Um, and then also how to branch into like this business of being a professional right. artist. So that's kind of a long version of from then to now. So. Thank you. Um, I, I found two things interesting in that, in that the school never prepared you to be an artist, in a sense, right? And that uh, you brought up the business aspect of it. And I think I just learned recently that um, an artist isn't, a, isn't an artist. An artist is an entrepreneur, really. That's what we are. Would you agree or disagree? No, I would absolutely agree. And I think that's one thing that can really be lacking in universities and academics, because you kind of understand skills or you're even gaining uh, more understanding of the history behind art a little bit. Yeah. And then you're standing to say, whoa, now, whoa, 
well, how do I make this a business and how do I do it? And certainly I had exposure as a young child to see that it can work. It can happen. You can make a profession out of this, whatever that looks like on the scale as to whether you are full-time painting, part-time painting, a quarter-time painting. Mm-hmm. There is a, there's an avenue for every person at this profession. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like any profession. You you start off in the low rung and you just work your way up, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so f- for people who don't really know your work, uh, how would you describe your style of painting? Yeah, good question. So I definitely feel like I land in representational. So it's representational. A barn looks like a barn. A tree looks like a tree. Mm. But I'm not photorealistic. So I'm going to say it's representational impressionism. So representational impressionism of the pastoral landscape. Pastoral would be like the umbrella of subject matter that I'm drawn to, but certainly I'm trying to capture capture the beauty of like the light settings that I'm seeing out there. And, and plain air is a big part of my work on how to do that. I mean, we all know as we're going out there and taking photographs that you come home and you're like, wait, that was not what I saw. And so being yeah. out there during specific times of light, observing the same subject matter under different types of lighting, and then going at it and, and using small studies and painting it that way. But yeah, definitely representational impressionism of the pastoral landscape. Yeah, perfect, perfect. I have to agree with you with, with photos. And I think that's why it's so difficult to paint from photos is that you have this beautiful scene in front of you and you come home and it's turned into this flat, mundane, average scene, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. So that kind of brings us to the next question. Uh, you know, when you come up to a location, what makes you stop and think, yeah, I really want to paint that? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think that's a question that every artist should ask themselves when they come up to the location. Because I think for me, certainly first and foremost, the main characters of that draw and that excitement is going to be the light and the color that I see. Um, whether that I mean, it could be strong lighting, like what's behind me, a, a sunset mm. or a gray day. And so then you have this beautiful milky white sky with a muted um, outline of a tree barn and things like that. And, and these temperature shifts all throughout a really a two value plane composition. So truly it is the light and colors that I see first. And then secondary to that, I would classify it as the juxtaposition of opposites. I'm really drawn to how in the pastoral landscape, especially with barns, um, how this dynamic roof line can occur amongst all of this soft foliage and how that is the juxtaposition and that's an opposite play. But also digging deeper, it would be the organic nature of the side of a barn that's been weathered by time and and you know, the weather and everything that's happening. And that almost now feels like it's growing back into the landscape. So it's like this pairing of old versus new, soft versus hard, uh, red versus green. I mean, a red barn and green foliage. Yeah. like, wow, there we go. Um, so it's just kind of that interplay. Of okay. Opposites. Okay. And that, that's interesting because it brings me up to one of my questions. And I, I'm just going to share this is this is off your Instagram feed. Now, the, your your whole idea about the juxtaposition of a barn against the softness of a tree, I found interesting. And and so this brings me to this question. This is a photo from the location you're at. And then this is a photo that you've manipulated in in Photoshop. And what I find interesting is you added these jaggedness juxtaposition areas of the barn compared to the original photo. Mm-hmm. You know, you changed also added a gate for an entry and a pathway up to that gate um but i guess what i find interesting is it kind of exists in reality but you've taken it to the next step and you've enhanced it to the sense that now you have a painting that has a little more variety and interest yes that's exactly right so i think you want to be looking at areas where you can just add those lines, those little nooks and crannies, those shapes, go back to the Photoshop version. Okay, right here. So you can see from the original, if you go back one more, 
it seems pretty flat. Like I liked the roof line, but I felt like, no, there can be more that happens there. And this now becomes a play on observing, observing, observing. So there's so many times where you drive by maybe a barn and there are large planks of, of the shingles that are now missing and it adds peak holes and interest. And you draw from those previous experiences to now come to the table with a new scene like this to now say, oh yeah, now what if I added this in here? And how do I yeah. add this? There was a window that I added in that's very, very subtle, but it's in that shaded area. And it now just brings your eye to see that window, to now go up the roof line, to now hit the pooch of, pitch of the roof line. The clouds I manipulated a little bit more to draw you into the focal point, which now mimics the pathway leading in as well. Yep. And, and then it's also a matter of looking at your subject matter to say, well, what can I eliminate that's not necessary here? So if you go back to the original, you see this big pole that's blocking you and like stopping you from entering in. Of course, we don't want to paint that. Absolutely. And it's funny because, you know, as a beginning plein air painter, you're kind of out there painting everything that you see in front of you, not recognizing that you can edit out a lot and that can enhance your, your idea. I remember one workshop that I went to, you know, bless her heart, there was this gal that came and she... She was there painting the beauty of the mountain, but she put the pine tree literally right in front of the mountain because it was there. And that's yeah. what she saw. And, you know, you, you kind of learn from these a little bit. You realize, oh, wait, yeah, I don't have to put that in. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. That is so funny. I, although I have to say when I first started out too, you know, I want to be true to the scene and I put everything in and exactly, it was for the detriment of the painting in the end. Right. Right. Yeah. And I have another example again. And I, what I find fascinating, I find this photo so dull and so boring, but you did, you, you put in a window next and you cut in a little bit of the roof at the top. You put some slats at the, the big door and you've added some grasses to the snow. And what a huge difference does this make to this static image? And you've yeah. actually changed the snow in the back too. And you've come up with this beautiful little gem. Yeah, and if you want, let me show you the 12 by 12 version because I've slightly changed it from there. Again. I've got it in my hands. If you, I don't know if you can go back to yep. seeing me. There we go. Yeah, so it's funny from that 12 by 12, I had my skyline in here and then I realized the way the painting read, like your eye just went straight to this line here. So I even just decided I got to eliminate that make it the mountain, keep that feeling like it's just exceeding beyond the canvas. And now my focus is in here without this distracting a line a little bit. But, yeah, absolutely. You know, all of those elements. And you can see like what, what time this takes, the process it takes. Like no longer am I pulling up a photograph and saying, okay, I'll paint that. Now I'm asking better questions. I'm thinking about line, shape, color, value, texture, edges. Mm -hmm. All of that goes into play now. And I'm trying to break it down to, to each specific element separately. Because what's really helpful is if you take your photographs, and even if it's in Photoshop or using like tracing paper, and you, you take a photograph that you think is great, trace over every single line that you see, take that image away, mm -hmm. which you can get layers in Photoshop. And then just look at the line work and you're going to say, how's my spacing? Is my sky and cloud space equal? Are my, That's interesting. Yeah. my sky space equal? Like, and then your brain is like, aha, now I have the freedom to manipulate that and change a little bit more. And then you can say, okay, well, how's my shape? Do I have large shapes? Like large shapes juxtaposed with small shapes that add variety. How's my value palette or my value contrast going to be? Is it a close value range? Is it a broad value range? And you just keep going further, further, further and digging deeper. And, and then you can bring it all back together. And it's almost like because you've addressed all these areas separately and fine-tuned them, when you're ready to then do a small sketch, like I'm not even saying do the big one yet. It's mm -hmm. Do the small sketch you've got all of it figured out and then you can build up from there and it just goes so much it, the, the process goes faster but by doing this i'm also creating more successful paintings consistently oh yeah without a doubt what, what, i'm gonna have to try this because 
what it does though it also allows you an entry into changing like um a lot of people when they start doing their thumbnail sketches well i don't know where to start and it seems like just tracing or not or tracing it or outlining it in photoshop and looking at just the the line and the shapes that gives you an automatic in about oh i need to start changing this then you're on a roll and by the time you get to your yeah. little sketch you've kind of have a lot figured out and you just move from there and then of course that'll lead to another iteration um, yeah. So uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna try that. And so that that leads me into, um, I mean that that's really is all design related to uh, a painting. But when you're out in the field, do you have any like go to compositions you go to? Like we always hear about the armatures of the uh, like the L and the S and uh, the O's and the rule of thirds or guidance thirds. Do you ever just rely on those elements without designing? Or you? I did probably five years ago when I felt uncomfortable, a little bit more unsure. So it was almost like I wanted to use some tried and true suggestions. Mm -hmm. Edgar Payne's book is phenomenal mm -hmm. and they really do work. Um, so I think if anything, knowing I'm painting barns, I guess it would be like the grouped mass composition. Um, I certainly do like the still yard with radiating lines. I think that's oh, yeah. helpful. I mean, it's, yeah, and I, I, my attitude has changed over the years of plein air. I used to feel like you needed to get out there and complete a painting, start to finish, make it look as finished as you possibly can. But now I, I'm really like, okay, who cares about composition? I'm just trying to grab these color notes. And when I go back to the studio, I'll figure that out a little bit, you know, and I definitely do some small sketches first just to get the idea out. But anymore I feel like no I'm not even worried about how accurate my drawing is or how correct my composition is I'm just trying to grab color notes and what I'm seeing now that is specific to me just going out and observing if I'm at a plein air event I'm certainly going to come to the table already with an idea of the area that I want to kind of go and paint or maybe some thought process of I really would like to do a tall vertical tree painting of some aspens. Okay, what would that look like? Maybe I do a little foreground with a really, really tall vertical and radiating lines, just like Chauncey Ryder does. He does an amazing job with keeping a horizontal format, making the trees uh, go past the canvas and dropping the foreground, foreground down way, way low yeah. with radiating lines, and it creates this amazing vertical height. So, you know, and if clouds like if I were to do a cloud painting yeah you could say group mass or or the the, the O kind of thing that Edgar Payne talks about in his book um but yeah I think you just have to you just come out there and say what is it that grabs me first and foremost and then yeah what are some compositional elements and how can I capture this as quickly as possible and then certainly when you're out there studying on your own versus when you're at a planner event that mentality shifts a little bit. You're a little bit more concrete on, I want to nail this down if I'm at an event. Oh, I could see that for sure. I mean, especially uh, I saw one of your posts about a quick draw. I don't know how those work, but I think you'd really need to know what you're doing going into that already, would you not? Do they give you time to prep or? Well, and so this is what's interesting. I participate in two totally separate quick draws. One quick draw where it is true to what I consider a quick draw as you stamp your canvas, you have two hours, you are out painting plain air, you probably want to stay close to the area and not take 30 minutes to drive to a location, you're, you're painting from life on the spot, blank canvas to finish product. I've done that. Um, and that to me is a true quick draw. The one that I think you're referring to is the Jackson Hole quick draw where we are actually able to come prepared with the idea in mind and a little bit of the canvas started which I think oh. can which because so in that mind I was like whoa this really is not quick draw then but that was helpful and I did use again I, I get so freaked out at these events and I'm so nervous but I'm just like whatever preparation I can do I'm gonna do it so like I did a small study of the the barn which I have here up on my wall and I pre-mix my paint because I'm like, I don't want to spend 25 minutes Perfect. trying to mix. So I pre-tubed and I knew exactly what I was doing. There was no hesitation. There was no question. And 
just knowing myself and my nerves, like that's kind of the route I have to go. But it it worked, and I was able to finish in time, and I wasn't frazzled. And I don't know, preparation is. <laughs> oh no, no, always... especially in an event like that, right? <laughs> yeah. So. Um. Okay, another plain air question. Um, you know, I've noticed in your previous interviews that you, when you enlarge a plain air piece, you do it incrementally. So you'll go from your, I don't know what you paint, maybe an eight by 10, but then you go to like a 12 by 16 or something like that. And then you'll go a little bit larger and then you'll finally hit your 24 by 36. And I never even thought about that. I have trouble jumping from my, you know, say six by eight to my eight, say 18 by 24. Mm -hmm. And I got thinking, well, that might actually help a, help a lot. Um, does it help you a lot jumping incrementally? It really does. And that was probably the best advice that artist John Burton out of California gave me. I was prepping for a, a solo show. This was several years ago. And, you know, asking, how do I do this? You know, talking to the gallery owners, they wanted a large, maybe two, three large, large works, several medium sized pieces and several small. And at that time, in my mind, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I got to get these big ones out of the way first. But mm. after talking to John Burton, he was so helpful to say, you know what, the best thing you could do for this month in preparation for this show, which is in six months, is do 30 small little six by eights. And then from those, you can pick your best ones, right? Okay. Then you could say, okay, out of these six by eights, I'm going to double that. So then it would be a 12 by 16 because you're keeping the, the parameters the same, right? Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. eight by 10 to a 12 by 16, you've now added inches that you've got to figure out the composition. True. So you, you need to keep those parameters exactly the same just so everything flows well. And yeah, I went out and I did the small study and then I did an on-site plain air, which was like an 11 by 14. And from there I doubled that. And it was amazing just working from small to medium to large. By the time I got to the large, I had painted that thing at least two, maybe three times. I knew what colors I was going to mix. I knew where the marks were going to be. I knew everything, but I wasn't aware of is sometimes when you have a painting that's this big, those expressive impressionistic marks, you're like, oh great, I got the problem solved. I figured it out. Well, if you jump from here to here, well, that tiny little mark and that little yeah. breath now just became a big space that you've got to figure out, do I have enough color temperature shifts? Is there enough information there? Is there too little? How do you address those things? And so the problem then just becomes a little bit bigger and then you can find yourself kind of struggling and fresh, being frustrated with yourself because. Mm -hmm. Well, now I got to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, and that was my biggest problem, jumping from the smaller one to the large one. So basically what you're saying is you double it. You find these problem areas kind of incrementally until you get to the very large one in which they're not a problem anymore. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And using the bigger brush certainly helps. And man, because my space here is so small, there are several times where you just have to get distance. You've got to get back from your work. Otherwise, you're just encroached upon it. And I brought my easel downstairs, stood way back in my kitchen and stood like 25 feet back instead of five. Oh, and nice. really was able to, to help. So one thing that helps me, if anyone else out there is working in a small space, um, the best thing that I've had in my studio here, even for these like little medium pieces is I've got a full length mirror and I can look at my work in the mirror and um, see where there's problem areas and get even further uh, view back from the, the image. So I'm just not coming up on it all the time. Yeah, yeah. And well, that's because I think because a mirror helps d double the space where the distance you put it away from, right? So it helps a exactly. lot. Yeah, yeah. And I, I want to go on a, uh, two words that you said in, it, that you just said in, in terms of um, the painting and this temperature shifts. And we had a little brief conversation about this before we let everyone in. And, and my comment, comment was, once you learn about temperature shifting in color mixing, it changes everything. You're not worried about color mixing at all. And it's not really even um, a concern anymore. It's all about value and temperature. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think so. And it becomes exciting at that point. And Absolutely. You're not not so worried about did I get that right green oh I'm seeing this green or, or what have you you realize no it's a blue or green it's a yellow or green it's a red or green and how 
And you just, what's even better is to say, is it warmer or is it cooler? That right. then simplifies it even more because then you can really start training your eye to say, okay, do I need an alizarin crimson right now? Do I need a cooler red or do I need a cat red, which is a warmer red? And then you're adding those in and then it becomes this really fun play of, yeah, now I'm getting the, the depth almost that you want in your work that you see so clearly in um, impressionists like Sargent, some of his works where it's super close value range, but he's got temperature shifts all over. Oh, yeah. And it's harmonious and it's beautiful with, it's amazing how much color he can get with restrictive color. Same with, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking on the artist's name. Zorn? Zorn, thank you. Yes, yeah. with limited palette. And all of his work is just so beautifully warm because of that limited palette. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm in love with Sorolla. Sorolla, <laughs> I think that's how you pronounce it. Sorolla, and yeah. It, Sorolla, yeah. I, I just, I mean, not, not only because of his loose brush strokes, but just his mixes are... The values are perfect and the temperatures are amazing, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and they seem more chaotic than Sargent's. Um, it's just, it's it's quite interesting to see the two side by side. Yeah, more chaotic. And I think more saturated. I think Soraya was a little bit more yeah. saturated, heavy in his his uh, color choices, which I love. I mean, I, I like that saturation. Yeah. It grabs me a little bit, so. Yeah. And this, this brings me to a question about um, not what colors you use, because I, I despise that question, because we all know colors doesn't matter um, when it comes to mixing. Um, but do you find that you need to say two or three reds, two or three yellows, two or three blues on your palette to be able to be able to uh, shift those temperatures? Or would you just be happy with one of each? You know, I, oh, that's a good question. I really... I would want two to three. And now that I'm kind of better understanding blues a little bit more, yeah, I'd want three to four almost because ultramarine um, can go really deep, really dark. Yeah. I like cobalt, but cerulean and cobalt, even a, a turquoise. Oh, if I had it, I, oh, maybe I do have it. Right here. Um, okay, this is the cobalt. Cobalt turquoise from Grumbacher. It's a great one to add to the mix because that sky as you're out there, you know, it's super violety and, and there's more reds as you're looking up. And then as that horizon line goes down, it turns greener. And so I find I need a cerulean. I need a mm -hmm. cobalt. A mix of those to add again the variety of that value plane and the shifting of, of the light. I don't want it to be a solid mass. I want a little bit more variety there. Yeah, and then sure. with the reds, I'd love to have the alizarin crimson um, and the cab red. Even the quinacridone uh, violet is a fun color to use. That and like a green gold, you can get some really fun effects by using those two as your primary colors. Um, yellows, you definitely want, you know, I like the, the cab lemon pure and cad yellow light. <clears throat> um, and then I use azo green, even transparent red oxide. Like it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting, barns that I like to paint. Um, that was one of the main ingredients way back when, when they would paint barns red, it was transparent red oxide. And uh, so it's kind of like, well, that makes sense. That that would be <laughs> color. Might as well make it, yeah, you might as well use it in your painting, right? <laughs> yep. And then I really like a, um, it's a quick drying alkyd light that helps speed up the drying time with my paints on the canvas. Okay. Do you use that in plain air or in studio as well? I uh, both. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So we're almost we're at the half hour mark, but I want to just ask you before we ask everyone else questions. So after this next question, if people want to ask questions, that'd be fantastic. Um, but I want to ask you how important would you say it is to be surrounded by other artists with not you know with the same passion as you. Um, and not only just at the same skill level, but maybe a little bit lower skill level and definitely at the higher skill level. Do you find that is important? I do. And we were chatting earlier and I was commenting how much I, I appreciate it. So my dad is still <clears throat> living and as an artist, you know, I talk to him every day and always within our conversation, something about art comes up. So I feel like he's like my, my go-to uh, camaraderie person, the artist that I can relate to, because inevitably, 
he'll get on the phone and say, oh, I worked on a painting today and oh, I made a mark and I just take. I'm like, dad, I know, I know. And you have to have your artist colleague to cheer you on in those moments of frustration because we all get there. And then you also need the person to help you say, well, what do you think about this? How do you, you know, how, how do I address this issue? And I'll give you ideas. But I also think, I like how you mentioned you want to reach up, you want to have artist friends or colleagues that are above your skill set. So you then reach up yourself. Yeah. I also think it's important to see those, you know, maybe that are not at your level. I think it just helps you have more gratitude for where you've come because this is a process. It's a lifelong process. And then you can share your knowledge base next to the person who is needing more information. And what you've learned is going to help spark them. It's going to help glean from them, just like you're reaching up for the the mentor that you're needing to help improve your skill set. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. And it's always interesting because I feel like I've had multiple conversations with artists that might be below my skill set, but yet they know about marketing. They have an expert in technology. And I'm yeah. like, okay, I am just nowhere near this. And so we we all help and it's just absolutely necessary because artists it's such a solitary profession and sometimes you can get too stuck in your own head and you need somebody else to help bring you back out oh yeah absolutely it's a, it's it's almost um self-absorbing too there was a time when i just wanted to focus on my style and i didn't want to take another workshop for the longest time and then at a point you realize well geez i'm doing something wrong because i'm not growing and you you really need that interaction right do you teach or do any workshops at all you know, I have, I do, and I have one coming up uh, in Idaho here in August. I haven't had a, I mean, I've, I've dabbled in it. I'm not regular only because of time and phase of life. Our youngest, yeah, five, so he's now going to all day kindergarten this fall. So I feel like the, the door is opening for that. But up to this point, it's been, I just kind of have the time that I can to paint and yeah. I can do a workshop, but I'm. I wouldn't say I'm like every year regular. So okay, so you, so you have a few under your belt at least, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would you say prepping for those workshops and actually providing the workshops might have improved your understanding of of art and and color mixing or value adjusting than it did before you taught? Absolutely, and it's yeah. it goes back to my fear factor where I'm like so nervous and just don't want to sound stupid or dumb and. <laughs> To share that's worthwhile and oh, oh that's so God, funny like, I legit over prepared but I dive into the masters you know Andrew yeah. Luke book about color like it's fabulous and you reread Richard Smith's book you reread about the old masters you reread all of it and then yeah. your brain is just electrified and you're like yes 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 okay yeah. sure and it's it's fantastic so yeah, yeah. And, I, and I don't think you really appreciate those books until you get to a certain stage as an artist and you look back at it and you think, well, where was that information when I started out? Meanwhile, you had that book for 20 years. I know. I right. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Intense study. We all need it. <laughs> oh, for sure. Every stage. Right. Um, so at this point, um, I do have some other questions, but if anybody has a question that they'd like to ask uh, Allie, please unmute yourself and ask or ask it in the chat itself. Don't be shy. <laughs> It's free game. Any question? Yeah, don't make me call on somebody. <laughs> okay. Well, people are still Hi. thinking. Oh, there you go. Someone's oh, here. Sorry. Hi, Allie. This is Ross Wheeler. How are you? Hey, Ross. How are you? I'm, <laughs> I'm doing well. Thank you for doing this. And uh, Mr. King, thank you for putting this on. Um, I did have a question in regards to, it's kind of beginning conversation and it had to do with um, things that are taught in school and based on what you've learned outside of that um, in a classroom setting. Uh, how best would you recommend getting through to these? We're talking very, very beginner stage artists. Um, they are coming, for example, my school, they're coming in at eighth grade. Uh, they take art one in eighth grade. And they come in with that mindset of, I don't think I can do this, you know, and it's, it's breaking that mold. But what would be the core element or pillars that would be best focused on on that age group? Because I uh, the reason I ask that is I don't, uh, I, where I had gone to college, uh, there was a lot of things that were taught only to come out of college and find that, oh my gosh, that that's not the case. I appreciated that earlier, how that was said, that a lot of the workshops kind of untaught 
some of the things that are traditionally taught in schools or in colleges. And I've personally tried to get away from that. Um, when you got out into your profession in art and based on what you learned, based on your filter, what would you start with with this young of age of students? We're talking eighth grade, most likely. You know, I would start, oh, it's, it still goes back to observational drawing. I think that's the key and drawing from life because I remember, let's see, well, we learned, I think too much we rely on the photographs and copying the photograph where I think if you could get them drawing from life and it could be something so simple, simple still life objects um, to understand, number one, you have a piece of paper how big am I going to feel that object on this paper and think about spatial relationships and also um, the, you know, perspective and sizing. I think that is key. If we could get eighth graders drawing more from life and that's really hard because they want it to look good right off the bat. You're going to see them erasing and, and not, and, and uh, maybe you get a pen in their hand and it's, it's the no fear of, Hey, we're not erasing, we're just drawing. And um, I remember back in the day where it was like you had that object and you, it was a, a piece of paper with um, maybe some complex design or something of a face or whatever. And then you turn it upside down and you have your copy that you're gonna, you're gonna draw on. And all you're looking at now is abstract shapes and you draw those abstract shapes and then you put both of them right side up. And all of a sudden, it's like what you've drawn really is more accurate to the image because now you've looked at it in abstract shapes instead of a nose is a nose and eye is an eye. Um, so I would say definitely those eighth graders, man, just get them drawing from life and, and try that. And then I think it's also helping them understand line shape color, value, texture, edges. Um, boy, and that's for any subject matter, whether it's a portrait, a cityscape, a landscape, a still life. Um, that's, where it's, that's where it's at. Because I really remember after I got my degree, I remember walking across the stage feeling like, I don't think I'm a better painter. And I was wanting the instructions so badly. And um, Unfortunately, I didn't feel like I really got it. And so it was truly taking workshops from professional artists that that's what increased my understanding. And it came back to those four core um, line shape, color, value, texture, edges, at least for my work. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ross. Ross is a great teacher. He's doing awesome things with those students. So good job. Oh, no, no. Yeah, anybody who's teaching students beyond what they teach them in school, I think is fantastic. Um, one of the, a great book that I wish I had when I was a teenager, um, eighth grade might be a bit young, but it depends how in depth or how excited these kids are about art. Um, but from Trafalgar or from square one to Trafalgar square by, uh, Richard E. Scott, um, it, it has to be the, the only book you ever really need to understand sketching. If you've never sketched before, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. You know, and watercolor medium is a great one to start with too. I was probably younger than that when my dad first got me my <clears throat> first watercolor set but that was fun and even master copies man if you could get them on master copies mm -hmm. too oh they would learn so much so much uh, michelle asks hey ali you want to come to kansas and paint barns <laughs> yes 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 michelle <laughs> <laughs> you probably know who that is then eh <laughs> yes <laughs> oh, uh, that'd be great. anybody else with some additional questions hello um, so I'm a rookie. Um, I'm, I'm relatively new to this, and but but I'm I'm really interested in this because it's it's about barns, and there's a barn that I've been watching for about ten years now decay, yes. and and I I've, I've tried painting it twice, and both times been unhappy with it, and and I'm and I think part of it is because I think what I love about it and what what I fixate on it as I go by is watching the decay. Um, so I'm watching how many more boards are, are coming off of it and I'm watching what's happening in terms of the, so the classic hip roof um, and I'm watching kind of what's happening with the roof and when I go to paint it I get hung up on on painting the decay um, so any advice because w when I finished I'm not satisfied with it are you wanting um, 
and and maybe okay what more satisfied are you unsatisfied with color choices are you unsatisfied with technicality of drawing it uh help me understand a little bit more there with what what do you come back away with and you're like okay i don't like that because of now that I'm, I, well, even even now that I'm framing the question, I think I probably have the answer. It's because I think, I think I, my hunch is it's a bit like trying to paint a portrait. I haven't done much in terms of painting portraits, but I think it's a, about trying to paint a portrait of somebody you really care about and that you've known for so long. My hunch is that's probably a difficult thing to do. And I think probably what I'm trying to do is paint a relationship uh, over time and capture that in a painting. Um, so I think I'm probably answering my own question. But I also think like, how fun would it be for you to do multiple paintings of these and and let them just be like take off the pressure of it's not right it's not perfect just just paint it and set it aside and now go see it again different weather different type of light and and really identify what is it today that draws me to this barn is it the light and shadow of the roof right now or is it an evening setting and it's just this beautiful golden glow against uh, a, you know, a, a sky and it's the clouds that interest me and try to hone in on those things and write them down and then try to capture it, photograph and photograph it. And also um, photograph it. Sometimes it helps with a DSLR camera where you can blur the lens a little bit. So then you're not getting hung up so much on detail. You're looking at big shapes and then photograph that over time. So now you've built up this library. You've got your sketches, you've got studies, plein air, you've got in studio, you've got photographs. Now you have a totality of this experience of this decay. And then from there, you can really put it all together to say, okay, what, what speaks to me? Was it this lighting? Was it this type of decay? Was it this shape? Whatever it is. And just allow yourself the freedom to really take time to document it and enjoy it and have fun with it. Because that's one thing that I did with a barn here that I need to go check on it, but I think it's pretty much bulldozed over because I saw the decay of everything around it come down. And uh, I was able to see it in all types of lighting. Some of my plain airs were pretty darn clunky, but I came home and, you know, tried to reevaluate what it was that I was seeing and try to make better color choices, closer value choices as well. So that way, what I liked about it and what I tried to remember and what I felt and what I saw, again, the impression of it, is able to be brought about. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, it does. I, I mean, I, yeah, I'm thinking haystacks. You know, um, the the yeah, it does. Now I wish I, I started on it five years ago, but uh, but, oh, right. but 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 you're right. I mean, and, and it, a big part of it is that like there's 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 um, blueberry fields in front of it, so you get that bright red, and it, so you get yeah. Okay, that's got me excited. Thank you. Good, good. That's Honest, what you need. Yeah excitement to go study and learn that's yeah. exactly all about and i think a lot of people just don't understand it either every time you do a painting you know it doesn't have to be a finished painting not at all you know as soon as i have shifted and this is so much indicative of art like you you want to light the fire and as soon as i for myself made the shift of stop thinking about how many paintings i can get for the gallery go out there and say what is exciting to me out here what do i want to try to learn what am I trying to gain here? And just be out and about and, and see and experience something. And, and just like Steve has talked about where you've seen the decay and you want to gather that. And then you get excited thinking, well, what does it look like today? What does it look like tomorrow? What's going to happen? And then it just feeds that fuel and the excitement of learning and trying to captivate what you're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rick has a question. He says, uh, can you please tell us about your process of scouting locations and sites before committing to set up, setting up your gear? And do you do sketches before um, painting or taking a photo? Yeah, so I'm going to answer that in a two-part question or two-part answer. First scenario is I'm out at a planner event and I know in three to four days, I've got to have a painting ready to go on the wall. Um, I come to the table knowing if I can only display maybe three paintings, I know I'm going to try to paint at least six, maybe seven, because not all of them are going to be winners. I'm going to tank on a few of them mm -hmm. and that's fine. Just expect that. So then it becomes, okay, what do I like? I think you need to come to the table to these events, knowing what interests me. Do I want to paint old cars? No, I don't. That's not my, 
that's not my genre. So you kind of come to the table understanding a little bit more about where your interests lie. And then you can come to say, okay, if I know I want, let's say, a, a mountain ridge, I need to be there at 7 a.m. because the light's going to come and hit it. And what's the color going to look like at 7 a.m.? Then I'm going to maybe say, okay, this is great. I could <clears throat> start a painting at that point, not even knowing I'm going to finish it because that light's going to change within 45 minutes, maybe even 30 minutes. So you might even just color note sketched in, set it aside. Move on to the second second location. So maybe you're painting two paintings a day, maybe even three, and then day two, if you can go back to the location to go start on the first painting you did to get more information, you can kind of work it that way. I do sketches. I think sketches are totally valuable and totally helpful to just nail out the idea. You've got to get those thoughts on paper, I feel like, and get some things figured out before you're going to the canvas. When I've done that, the canvas just is, it just flows better. You've got some information written down. You might even have words written down to say, you know, strong color, close values, textures, whatever. Whatever that idea is, whatever you saw that brought you to that spot, that's what you're going to try to bring about. So that would be how I would handle like a plein air event. And then I think it's helpful to get away from the scene and just look at your painting in its frame, because a lot of the times you have to have a frame, and just sit back and really look at it and say, is it lacking anything? Do I need an extra mark here? Do I need a punch of color? Do I need to add a little something? Or what didn't work? Is there an edge that needs to be softened to bring something else about? You're gonna almost give yourself a self critique and try to hone in on added things that you can make it better, and then you submit it. Um, so then when you're going out for myself, when I'm going out to just study and observe, I've actually made on my phone <clears throat> a map location of all these barns that I like. So that way I can look on my phone and be like, where was that? I don't remember the street. Oh my gosh. And, and I even have written on my, my studio wall right now to say if there's dramatic lighting, meaning we just had a cloud, like a rainstorm come through, the sky is that brilliant deep blue and the light has just hit some, a structure or something, head to the station. Because I know as I've searched my area around enough, I know where the sun is hitting, what type of day it's going to be, and then I can grab it. And I'm yeah. prepared, ready. And it's exciting because now you're like, whoa, this was amazing. Here, let me grab it. And then when I'm doing those, I mean, they're little, they're, they're little, like, and I'm palette knifing it, just, just trying to grab something because I know I'm going to come back to the studio. I'm going to have more time to think. It's not adding more detail, but it's more time to just really think what was it that I'm trying to bring about, you know, and one thing that's helpful. So I'll show you on this guy. These were just really kind of, um, anyone who's familiar with my work might recognize the large version of this. But I first went and did some plein air painting and wash on location. They were horrible. I threw them away. I was so embarrassed. Like what I did was so bad because I was like, oh my gosh. I came back home, collected myself a little bit, had a cookie or something and got to work where I looked at my photograph and I started designing. And I remember from this, I was like, it was really the light and shadow shapes all in this um, wood area that made it exciting to me. But I do love these little uh, windows and stuff. However, I realized as I got going, these two elements were competing. I needed to block out that, eliminate something to now bring your eye down to where it was that I was most interested. Colors that I felt like were great and fine, but it was just a slight change to now help me bring your eye into what it is that I, as the artist, am wanting you to pay attention to. So, and how many times did that take? Okay, there was three. And then from there, I also took these colors, kind of pre-mixed them a little bit, went back on location with a larger canvas. And now I've come to the table a little more collected, a little more understanding what's my composition, what are my colors, what am I shooting for, what am I trying to bring about? And then it becomes a much easier, enjoyable process because you've now been prepared and you've prepared yourself a little bit. That was really long-winded. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Very comprehensive, though. I think it was perfect. 
Jones. Hey, Scott, how are you? Talk a, talk a little bit about gouache and oh. how you're using it and what, what you think you're going to do in the future with gouache. I hope to do larger gouache. It's been, gouache is, okay, so this really started with, I come to the table with, um, I'm going to say a pretty strong background in watercolor. My entire uh, final show was all in watercolor. I was doing a large watercolor sheet. So I love, I love the watercolor medium. And it was Scott Christensen seeing his work in gouache that I was like, oh my gosh, I want to get this back out again. And I want to do this. Gouache has really given me the freedom to make more expressive marks and to not be so mentally brain blocked on, I'm going to make a mistake. I think that's the freeing part is when I'm working small and with this gouache medium. And it took a minute to get used to it. Like I was working in it really, really kind of like watercolor, really light. And I realized I could kick up my saturation a lot more. Um, but it's helped. It's helped me figure out the kinks. It's helped me give more confidence to now going to an oil painting without fear, which is really helpful. Because I think sometimes that can be a real roadblock. Um, and I hope to do more. I really do. I think it's, they're fun. They're expressive. They take a lot of work. Like there's one that I did um, and I did it two or three times and it was frustrating. I felt like, I'm just wasting my time here, but it was great. It just allows, allows you to work in the medium in a freer way. And I, I look at that and I, I look at the gouache and I think, where's a soft edge? Okay, that translates to a soft edge in oil painting. You can really build up the medium and it's, it's great. So hopefully, hopefully I can use some gouache this size and maybe even larger. We'll see. Oh, that'd be amazing, wouldn't it? Gouache that size? But, yeah, I know. Like a full sheet of watercolor paper on gouache. Yeah, all Whoa. I can think about is how much that would cost. A lot. Paint alone, right? So yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a we have a question from Susan here in the in the chat. Uh, behind you, it looks like you you it looks like there is a sketchbook with a couple of studies. And yeah. It looks like you may have some color mixes underneath one of them. Can you tell us about those, please? And do you document the colors you use at each painting? Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, okay, so. This was the first gouache that I did of it. And then I did this one just a little bit quicker and I realized I liked the more purple color relationship. So this is gouache down here and you can see the little tick marks. I'm trying to get my blue right. So even before I'm putting that gouache in the area where I'm creating the painting, I'm still testing it out because gouache dries quite a bit darker than when it's wet. So I'll make a tick mark. I'll wait a few seconds, maybe a minute, see mm. how it dries. So then I can check my value because that's one thing that I think gouache is tricky is we see these great gouaches out there, but they do dry darker. And so a lot of the times for myself, my sky value is too dark. Um, but then this right here is actually oil paint because I'm trying to now take this wash to oil and I want these colors. So I'm mixing my oil paint and just putting ticks down interesting to see how it compares and that's been really quite helpful um i don't know if I have any others oh oh that's all oil paint but same kind of thing here oil paint on canvas trying to figure out color tones and temperature shifts and all that good stuff but then i also write notes to myself so i have here that i want a warm glaze underneath this e because the light of reflected light underneath the eave of a barn right at when it reaches the edges here it always gets really warm so like i write notes for myself and i pay attention to i like this combination here and things that i want to remember when i'm going to oil nice smith color charts i know you recently done them how are you using them now oh my god don't even talk about color charts go ahead though <laughs> you know this the richard schmidt color charts I need to get those out more. I haven't done it so much. I think I've, I've enjoyed it and that was a great process, but it's so helpful if you take those out with you in plain air, because there is a point where you, as an artist, you're like, how, I don't even know how to mix that color that I'm seeing. And that's where the Richard Schmidt color charts come in because you can look at it and say, oh, 
It's a transparent oxide red with a little bit of green gold. Boom, there's my neutral green. And, you're, and you also can look at it and it's so helpful with values too. The one thing I've seen though, is a lot of people when they're doing those color charts, they don't get the lightest value light enough. So I remember when I was doing them, I would mix my large pool of the two colors together. So maybe it's transparent red oxide with um, green gold. I'd mix a big pool of that. And then here, your lightest value is supposed to be just a titch off of white. So I would take my white and I would like tap into that pool that I painted with my um, palette knife and just concentrate on this value being just a slightly off white. And then I would mix my middle value and then I would go to my two from there. So then I have those, those uh, value stages broad enough and just off white and where it should be in the middle range with the two in between. So I think that's helpful if anybody's doing those, but they, man, they're so good. And one thing that helped me with those color charts was I really at one point was frustrated with um, how garish my greens were looking. And because I was mixing ultramarine blue and cat yellow light and not getting enough red in there. And it wasn't until I mixed cat orange and it was either cobalt or ultramarine blue. And I realized that's the green that I want. I want that green. And so I honed in on that green and then did some color palettes and tonal, um, uh, I have it here, tonal um, designs off of that. So it just helps you like see the breadth of where you can go, but also keeping it very harmonious as well. Yeah, so very true. I went through that whole process myself, and um, the biggest thing I got out of it was a stronger wrist. It's a, yeah. lot of, it's a lot of work, isn't it? How much it hurts your hand just mixing it's all that? So much work, but it's yeah. so worth the work. Yeah, like, I still got I, mine. I don't fear anymore on mixing color. And it's just like the temperature shift, when you said, and it's, yeah. it's so helpful. Yeah, once you, once you realize that it's value and temperature, color is almost secondary, but um, mm -hmm. Sometimes, though, like you say, you just need to how to figure out that steely blue. How do you get that? And you go back to what you painted, right. and you yeah. see, oh yeah, it was this and this, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So one of the big questions here, because we all get imposter syndrome at one point or another, it could happen every day or it could happen occasionally, regardless of your professional level, right? So how do you manage discouragement, and not just from others, but in yourself, especially? Because I know sometimes you're at that stage of a painting and you know it's going to come together or you're in a, you're you, just like yourself, you went out plein air painting, tried to do a plein air painting and you just bombed. Well, it sounds like the first thing you did, you came home and you tried to resolve the design to mitigate that feeling. So mm -hmm. is that, besides that, uh, what are your ways of uh, mitigating discouragement? Oh, gosh. Um... You know, letting a painting sit for a while, mm -hmm. even a long while. I've got one that I was working on three years ago, and I finally just realized I don't like the barn, and I just painted it right out. And I think letting it sit so that way you don't have that <laughs> that heated aggression, that bad luck <laughs> you and that painting, uh, letting it sit for a while, and then also. Um, really asking yourself some of those hard questions to say what didn't I get here and up to this point I think I if I would have had a bum plein air painting or studio painting I probably would have said well I'm not really a rock painter I'm going to go find something else instead of me saying well what was it about this and really break it down to line shape color value texture edges what did I miss what's not going here did I bite too too big I think that's a real Mm. Problem is we go out there and, and specifically to plein air, we start out too big. Same thing in the studio. Do you have all of this figured out before you're starting a canvas like this? Like for me, I've learned, no, I need all those little bugs figured out before I'm getting here. And then, you know, it goes back to just having those mentors. I think learning, it could be that I don't know enough here and I need some instruction from another artist or how they've done it, how did they solve the problem. And I think also bouncing off the ideas and recognizing with your peers, somebody at your equal level, hey, we're all in the same boat. Yeah, we've all been there and they might give you an idea to help you get out of your 
at your funk or something and just allowing yourself to realize at the end of the day, it's just paint funk. <laughs> Well, that's it. <laughs> but that's true because it doesn't really represent you as a whole, does it? It's no, just like, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's I think, a, that's a career, yeah. I think what's really tricky though is this whole realm of social media, and it can really skew with your psyche. And even for myself, I've even had to like distance myself a little bit because you, I get so captivated by these great and I wish I knew his name he's an artist that just puts this thick chunky paint on he's doing these faces and I love it and I get thinking wow he did that in like 15 seconds uh I'm struggling over here for like two days on this what's the matter with you and you you kind of lose the reality of this takes time this takes a lot of time and that's another way to help me just bring it back down to realize okay it takes time I got some stuff I got to figure out so. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess what you're saying, and I, I think this can apply to, to a lot of the situation is it's all about process, have a process instead of just throwing paint on a canvas based on a photo, right? Do your time, do your prep work. And then when you get stuck, look at it as line, shape, value, temperature, mm -hmm. positioning, and you'll come up with something each time to fix. And you do that enough, you fix enough things, chances yeah. are it's going to be finished, right? Yeah, and I think also a part of that needs to be the integrity of your work. What do you love and what is your eye? What can you bring? Just like Steve was saying how he was loving the deterioration of this barn, this yeah. all, I mean, how great that he's identified it. He's drawn to it. Okay, well, go capture that. Go see it. Go, yeah. go study it. And now it becomes, you have something to talk about with people when they're asking you about your work. You're able to communicate and say, I've seen this thing. and five years time and here's what happened and it's exciting and you're sharing it and that becomes not only the integrity of you as an artist and what you can bring to the table but it brings a wealth of um just a, a wealth to to the work and a, a body to it a story behind it if you will yeah exactly right it imparts more value to it as well right yeah yeah all right, so we're, we're just after seven o'clock. So instead of just taking more questions, I think I just want to say thank you, Ali, so much for being our first interview here. Um, I think it, I think it went pretty smoothly. I loved your questions. It's more than I could have hoped for, without a doubt. Your wealth of knowledge has surpassed mine. So now I'm going to have to glom onto everything you post on Instagram. <laughs> well, thank you. This was great. I hope it was uh, helpful to anybody. But if there's more questions that anybody has, feel free to put them on the Artful Minds and and we'll answer them and and get more information out there so everyone can feel like oh wow yeah, thank you want to make better paintings every day and that's the goal thank you very much and as a reminder not to take away the wealth of knowledge that ali just departed on us but um our next inspirational discussion is coming actually this sunday uh may 22nd with tushar sabale i believe that's how he pronounced his name um and registration is open on our website uh artfulminds.ca under the events calendar um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Ali. I appreciate it. Thanks for everyone who attended. Um, I can't say any, I'm, I'm ecstatic. Thank you very much, everybody. Hey, thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for joining. Great. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye-bye.